Well, it finally happened. After decades of waiting and after weeks and weeks of dodging spoilers, Julie and I finally saw the new Top Gun movie. And I've got to say, it's one of the best movies I've seen in a really long time. It's incredible. It's got everything you'd want in a movie. It's got a good storyline, the appropriate level of romance. It's got unbelievable visual and audio effects. It's got nostalgia. It's got action scenes and fighter jets. It's got it all. But can I key you in on a little secret? I actually didn't want to watch the movie, not initially at first, and I definitely didn't want to watch or didn't want to like it because the original is one of my all-time favorite movies, and I didn't want it to be ruined by being just another reboot that seems to be the trend in Hollywood anymore. I didn't want it to be spoiled for me because that movie reminds me of my childhood. It reminds me of sitting with my brother and my cousins dreaming about what it would be like to be a fighter pilot. How cool is that? It reminds me of a time when, when we were all more carefree and life was simpler. But I almost missed out on seeing one of the best movies I've ever seen simply because I was finding it difficult to let go of the past. Now, I bring this up because the, the church in the ancient city of Colossae themselves were having a hard time of letting go of the past. The church there was primarily made up of Gentile converts to Christianity, but they're still surrounded by the culture that they came out of. They're still being tempted to live the exact same lives that everyone else is living around them, the exact same lives that they had grown accustomed to living before. See, they had heard the gospel and believed, which we read about at the start of chapter 1, but, but they're being drawn back into old habits, chasing the same things they've always chased, talking the same way they always used to talk, and living the exact same way they used to live. But Paul knows that there's a better life out there for them. So as we continue in our series where we're walking through the New Testament book of Colossians, written by the Apostle Paul and talking about his underlying message that Jesus Christ is Lord over everything, this week we're focusing specifically on how Paul addresses the difficulty they're having of letting go of the past by talking about a better future, a better life for them with Jesus as Lord over their passions and pursuits. And he starts by talking about their minds. He's instructing them and challenging them on, on what they're thinking about. Because what we care about and what we think about are, are pretty deeply connected. See, what's on our minds is actually reflective of what's in our hearts. Things that we hold nearest and dearest to us are actually the things we tend to think about most often. And if we look, uh, if you take a look at the city of Colossae, we start to understand things that they cared about, the things that they valued, the things that they thought about. See, the city was one of three that made up an important trade route in the area. And so the culture and religion of Colossae was, was a blend of a lot of different other cultures and religions that passed through. And this informed and shaped and influenced the kind of lives that they lived, the kind of things that they valued, the kind of things that they talked about. But if you notice in verse 5, Paul describes this kind of lifestyle, this value system. He uses words like earthly. He describes it as immoral, impure, evil. He says that these are the kinds of things that invite in the wrath of God. This is not the kind of thing that the people of God should be aiming for, right? Yet these are the things that the Colossians are being called back to. These are the things that they're being told should be on their minds. It's what they're thinking about doing. It's the things that they're starting to miss. The Colossians are remembering the days when they got to chase after the things that made them feel good and things that filled them with all kinds of pleasure. That's what they're focusing on. That's what they're thinking about. But it's not just on their minds. Paul describes it as being in them. These earthly, immoral, evil, evil things that they're doing aren't just on their minds, but it's inside of their hearts. Now, let's, let's press pause here and take a look at, at how we're doing as a country. Let's compare it to Colossae. As America, one nation under God, founded on Judeo-Christian principles, how are we doing? Well, the sad truth is that the, the statistic seems to be that church attendance has been on a steady decline over the last number of years. And our society is moving closer and closer to a post-Christian era where biblical ideals and principles are starting to be seen and touted as as narrow-minded and outdated or even offensive. See, 2022 America isn't all that different than ancient Colossae. We hear more and more people say things like, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. 
We see story after story and read headline after headline of people who have been demoralized, dehumanized, based solely off of differences, based off of their age, their weight, their gender, their skin color, their ideology, what have you. We're also being encouraged to to affirm and primarily identify people based solely off of their sexuality and preferred gender, whether or not we agree with it. See, in many ways, we're living a lot like the Colossians. And we in the church are living a lot like the Christians did in Colossae. Not only are we being pressured by culture outside of us to to think a certain way and live a certain way and value certain things, but we're also having a hard time. We're struggling letting go of the former lives that we knew before Christ. Now, I know a lot of us in here were baptized as infants and brought up in the church, so the temptation is to sit and think, oh, well, I've never known a life outside of Christ. But allow me to be the first to tell you that, yeah, yeah, you have. You just may not remember it all that well. Because all of us are born into sin. We're born as sinners, born into a world that doesn't know Christ but is in desperate need of him. So while that time may have been shorter lived for some of us than others, all of us know what it's like. We have all experienced a life outside of Christ, a life apart from him. And that life continues to call us back continues to convince us to miss that old life, beckoning us, beckoning us to enjoy the pleasures that this world has to offer and experience that life once again. It crawls into our, our hearts by creeping into our minds, telling us the things we should be valuing and thinking about. And it gets all of us, and sometimes it's really sneaky. It gets us when we're sitting on 610 at 1.30 in the afternoon and bumper to bumper traffic because God forbid there's ever not traffic on that highway. And what is it that we're all thinking when we're sitting there? If you're like me, you're thinking, I wish all of these fools would just fall off the face of the earth. Just get them out of here because I want to go wherever it is that I want to go and I want to get there now. Or it gets us when we're filling our cars up at the gas station And we're cursing every politician, past, present, foreign, and domestic, because we're watching our paychecks go into our gas tank, and then our kids' college tuition, and we're just praying it hits full before we have to pull from retirement. Or it gets us when we start to wonder if our marriage has run its course because our spouse no longer suits our needs or or gives us the attention we desire. So we start to wonder if maybe we'll be happier, better off with someone else. Maybe we'll have a fuller life then. Or how about this one? Does it get you when you're scrolling through Instagram or Facebook and you see someone you follow post something that you disagree with, have a different opinion on something like abortion, and you think out loud or maybe to other people, how on earth can they call themselves a Christian and think like that? It gets all of us. And all of these are ways that that we cling to the life we once knew outside of Christ, a life where where my power, my passions, my will, and my wisdom reign supreme, That, that, that I need a life where everything around me is an object to be used for my pleasure and my own advantage, and everyone who isn't with me is therefore against me, and they stand in my way, so I need to cut them down, drag them out, neutralize them as a threat. And everyone who is with me now gets to serve me so long as they stay useful. After all, that's the story of sin. That since God is telling you not to do something that looks and sounds pleasing to you, that that he appears to be robbing you of a certain experience that you want to partake in, it means he's against you. And so the best God for you is you. Because after all, you're the only person with your best interest at heart. You're the only person who's thinking about what's going to make you happy. And the fullness of life is found in satisfying and glorifying and pleasing you. But that kind of thinking, that kind of value system is exactly what Paul is trying to combat here. He's warning against that level of thinking because he knows it determines our steps. That's why he starts all of this by talking about our minds because what's on our minds is what's in our hearts. And what's in our hearts is what we pursue. That's what we chase after, is what we care about. What we care about is what we think about. And what is it that we're all actually trying to pursue except the fullness of life? Every single choice that we make, every word that we say, every thought that pops into our head is ultimately about life. 
Or it is we're going to go to lunch after this that's going to give us the best experience and the highest quality of food. What job do we need to take that's going to give us the most financial security and career fulfillment? Where are we going to go on vacation that's going to give us the optimal rest and relaxation and make people at home the most jealous? What are we going to talk about that makes us sound like we have it all put together? If only more people thought like we did. And whenever these things no longer provide us with the highest quality of life, we cut it out, we cut ties with it, move on towards something else that promises us will. And these things aren't bad in and of themselves, but, but none of them are permanent. None, none of them are ultimate. They'll all eventually fade away. Friends come and go. Job markets change. So does management. So what happens to us when we pursue these things as the ultimate and they fade away? Because they will. What happens is it takes a little part of us with it. We end up feeling lost or broken or confused or empty. We're left feeling a little bit dead inside because ultimate satisfaction isn't found in worldly things. True life isn't found in things that fade, things that flutter away. But some of you continue to pursue them. You continue to chase after them with everything you've got, doing whatever it takes to achieve whatever life you think you should have at whatever cost to anyone. And every time you take another step towards whatever it is that's promising you the fullness of life in this world, you're actually inching closer and closer to a life full of pain and suffering. A life that leads to death because there's no life in it. And Paul's message for you is the same message that he had for the Colossians. The message that God has brought his wrath to the worldly things inside of you by pointing them at his son who pursued you even when you were pursuing the things of this world, who took on your sinfulness, your immorality, your impurity, your evil, and he nailed it to a cross for you. He saw the death that you were so blindly marching towards, and he stepped in for you. He took on that death upon himself, and he rose up again victorious out of the grave into everlasting life. And by virtue of your baptism, that old life that you used to live has been left in that tomb. You have been joined together, united together with Christ into his life as a new person, as a new creation, as a new self who is holy, beloved, and forgiven by God. A new person who's filled with things like love and joy and peace. And then we continue to pursue things from time to time that are in this world. Though sometimes we we trick our minds into thinking those are the ultimate thing, Christ continues to pursue you in things like the Lord's Supper, and things like absolution, where he hears our confession, where he gives us freely his forgiveness. He continues to recreate you day after day after day, and he continues to use the new life that you have to bring new life to the world around you because he lives and moves in and through his church, which you're a part of. He does all of this. He provides new life to this world through you, So stop looking at the things of the past. Stop looking backwards. Stop looking at where the world says life is found. Don't think about those things anymore because that's not who you are anymore, Paul tells us. Those things don't get to rob you of life because that life you once knew is no more. That person you used to be who only used to think in terms of the world, chase and care about the things of this world, pursue the things of this world, that person is gone. It's left in a grave. That's no longer you. You are a new person because you have been joined together with Christ and he is your life. And any life that you seek apart from him isn't life at all. Outside of him, there is nothing but death. He is your life. And since he's raised you up into new life in him, You get to think about the things that are above, care about the things that are above, seek the things that are above this world. You get to seek a life that's greater than anything this world has to offer. And the life that you've been given in him now frees you up to pursue the fullness of life by dying to yourself and living for him, by joining him on his mission and bringing life to this broken world through how you live. So if the old self listens to a world that says it can give you life, the new person, the new life inside of you says, "Uh uh-uh, that's not life at all. The only life I have is because of Jesus Christ and it belongs to him. And because you're in him, you get to live not through the things of this world, but you get to live to the world. 
That's where the fullness of life is actually found. That's what it means to truly live, to have a life that's lived less about you and more about others. A life that's marked by bringing life. You've died to using others for your own advantage. Now you live to show compassion to others for their advantage. You've died to seeing other people as your enemy. Now you get to see them as objects of forgiveness, as objects of your forgiveness and of God's ultimate forgiveness. You get to to live by not cutting people down to exalt yourself because Jesus Christ himself has exalted you and he's called you to be a part of a body that's marked by peace. And we don't have to complain about absolutely everything in the world now because we get to give thanks in everything to the one who gives us new life and who gives life to others through us day after day after day. That's what the new life is. So the original Top Gun was an exciting movie. Right? There was action, there was humor, there was fun. But there was also a lot of pain and heartache. And quite frankly, no storyline. And until you've experienced the new movie, you won't understand just how much better it is. See, all of us look back from time to time and, and want to relive a part of history, and that's fine. But you'll never experience the richness of living fully in the present if we're stuck trying to live a life in the past. The passions and pursuits that you had before you were in Christ may have been exciting, but the fullness of life can only be found in Him. That life you once knew, that life you used to chase, is dead. Though you continue to hear its whisper from time to time, it is but a faint echo because there's no life in that. You have been given new life by Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, who is alive, who is breathing, and who calls you by a new name, and who calls you for a new purpose. And he gives his life to you. And this life is so much better because it's not only lived in the world, but it's found above the things of this world. So Paul says, set your mind on the things that are above. Set your minds on Jesus Christ. Think of his goodness, his faithfulness, his grace, and his mercy. Think about the fact that he pursued you, even when you were pursuing the things of this world, to try to find your passions and your pleasures in them. But it was his good pleasure, his passion to seek you out, to die for you so that you might have new life in him. And let that sink into your hearts to beat in a new way for the glory of God and for the good of other people. And then watch as your pursuits change. Watch as you find yourself pursuing the fullness of life that is found in living in him by living a new life for him. Let's pray. Lord God, we, we thank you for the life that you give to us. That though we use this life sometimes to, to go back to the past, to live in worldly ways, that you are our great rescuer, that you pull us out of that, that you have marked us as those who have died with you through your death, but have new life in you as you have overcome the grave. Lord, we confess that we still continue to pursue the things of this world, things that we know you are against, things that, that invite your wrath. But we thank you that that's not what our life is marked as. That's not the end for us, that you promise us new life in you because you have covered us in your forgiveness and your sacrifice. You've called us by a new name as a new person filled with the things of you. We ask that you would continue to change our hearts each and every day. Help us to think about you and the things that that you promise us, the things that you offer. Rid us of ourselves so that we may live for you. Change our hearts to love the things that you love. Pursue the things that you would have us pursue. Lord, we ask that you continue to help us, help us on our mission 
of joining you on your mission to not be life takers, but life givers through the new life that you offer to us. May our lives be marked as, as those who live in you because of you and for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.